You're watching Let the Quran Speak. Muslims believe the Quran is the unchanging word of God. But can Muslims really prove that the Quran comes from God? Dr. Shabir Ali explains to us why he believes in the authenticity of the Quran. Now, uh, Dr. Shabir Ali, this is a question that's been raised many times by people. How can you be sure that this book that we have came from God 1400 years ago or more than 1400 years ago? Well, to begin with, uh, the Muslim belief in the Quran as the word of God is a matter of belief. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but are there signs indicating that this really is a revelation from God uh, viewed from a rational, reasonable pr perspective? The answer is yes. Uh, when we trace back this Quran to find out who, who was the first person associated with this, um, one would find the Prophet Muhammad who lived some 1400 years ago and uh, from and a Someone say, well, did the Prophet Muhammad write the Quran? Exactly, and from a historical point of view, this is how it would appear. This is the first man we find with the Quran, so he must have been its author mm -hmm. who promulgated this to, to the world. But uh, uh, from, from a psychological perspective, it seems odd to say that this is Muhammad's own work because uh, the, the book itself commands the Prophet, speaks to him, tells him what to do, and uh, on occasion even criticizes him. Uh, it's uh, the, the whole tone of this Quran is that there is an external mind speaking to the mind of the Prophet Muhammad. For Muslims, that is the mind of God revealing the message to the Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. uh, second, uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was uh, sincere. Uh, 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 and this is known by, uh, to historians. This is what they have acknowledged, that when he said that the Quran came to him as a revelation from God, he himself really believed that. Now. I, if, if he was not sincere, we might suspect that he was trying Im by every means possible to cook up the Quran and to make it look as though it is coming to him as a revelation from God. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he was sincere and just simply telling it the way he believed it to be revealed to his mind, uh, it, uh, that at least eliminates that possibility that he was just trying to make it look good. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the third point is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is known from his biographies and in fact in, in, uh, from indications in the Quran itself uh, to have been unlettered. He wasn't trained to read or write mm -hmm. or to compose orally as were the master composers of his day. And yet the Quran has turned out to be a literary masterpiece in the Arabic language. It is the first Arabic textbook. So we should ask then, how, how did this uh, unlettered man uh, produce such a, a literary marvel? Mm -hmm. uh, the better explanation for that is that this is a revelation uh, from God to the Prophet Muhammad. Or, or you could say it's someone else's work and not the Prophet Muhammad's. In, in that case, we want to know who is the someone else, mm -hmm. and why would that someone else create this literary masterpiece and not take any credit for it? And, and then this goes back to the sincerity question, then the Prophet Muhammad must have known that this is somebody else's work, and then he is now passing it off as a revelation from God to himself. So that doesn't work either. So what convinces you that this is actually from God, like th th that God authored this book? Well, all of these reasons together, these are like many indicators, like many arrows pointing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a further point, another arrow, is that the Quran speaks about past history and details information that uh, were uh, not known in, in overt uh, writings and popular sources at the time. Uh, for example, it speaks about the preservation of the Pharaoh's body hmm. uh, in, in the 10th chapter in the 92nd verse. This now, is not mentioned anywhere else. Uh, well, it, it is mentioned actually in some uh, commentaries on, on ancient Jewish scriptures. Uh, but uh, in, in the main scripture, in the Bible itself, which would have been more popularly known, uh, we get the impression just simply from the book of Exodus chapter 15 that the Pharaoh drowned in the ocean and, and, and that was the end of, in the Red Sea, and that was the end of him. Um, but the Quran says, this day we have preserved you, we preserve you in your body that you may be a sign for those who come later. And indeed, the body of the Pharaoh has been recently discovered. Uh, those are four points so far. My fifth point will be that the Quran speaks about the future and uh, the future unfolds as depicted in the Quran. And since only God knows the future, this is a further indication. Mm -hmm. uh, the case in point is that in uh, the 30th chapter, uh, Surat al rum uh, there is a, a mention of the defeat of the Romans and uh, the prediction that they will soon turn around and uh, gain victory against the Persians who had uh, recently defeated them. Now, th th that prediction came at a time when it was unimaginable uh, from a human point of view that the Romans would, in fact, uh, gain a victory against the Persians. 
And this gave rise to some discussion about this at the time. But then it turns out that within nine years, as predicted in the Quran, the Romans did turn around and gain their victory as depicted in books on Byzantine history. Mm -hmm. uh, so here again, the Quran turns out to be, to be right. And it seems that this is a divine mind speaking to the mind of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but we there have some more time. Yeah, two more areas um, uh, that would be my my sixth and, and seventh point. I think are, are essential here. The sixth point is that uh, the uh, the Quran, in in giving its message to people at the time, used simple language that could be understood by by the Arabs uh, in the day. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it draws our attention to the cosmos, to things big and small, to even our own humble beginnings in the wombs of our mothers, and uh, in in you. Using uh, the uh, in, in calling the attention of people to all of these um, uh, phenomena, the Quran uses terminology and expressions which, I in a way, betrays modern knowledge. Like we're just discovering now the truth of these things. For example, in uh, Surah 51, the 47th verse, it speaks about the expansion of the universe. Uh, this is a modern concept. Uh, the Quran in Surah 21, verse number 30, speaks about uh, the origin of the universe when the heavens and the earth were one piece before God split them asunder. Uh, this resembles in some ways uh, the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe, which uh, is a very modern theory. The Quran says that in the same verse that God created everything from water, which too is a very modern concept that all living things are created from water. But do you think there are other um, books, for example, or revelations that you know people claim that have these other kernels of truth in them as well. Like for example, futuristic elements, past elements, if you, as you've mentioned. Yes, definitely. It, it is that just that the conglomeration of all of these points together, like all of these arrows pointing in the same direction. So many indications. When we come to science, in particular, mm -hmm. uh, from among my my seven points, the seventh I still have to detail. But from all of these arrows pointing in the same direction, and then the details. Because I could see people from other religious traditions pointing to some of these similar things. Uh, yes, Saying of course. That, you know, for example, there are elements of science in their books as well. Uh, people have tried. Uh, for example, somebody may say there is a statement in, a, in another scripture that says that uh, um, it speaks of the circle of the earth. Uh, well, a circle, as you know, is flat. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that is not really quite close. Whereas in the Quran, the Quran speaks about the heavens and, uh, uh, and the earth and, and, and about the day and the night um, being coiled around the earth. And, and the, the word for coiling is uh, yukawir. And, and that is that verb yukawir is related to the Arabic word for ball, which is kura. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it really gives us the, the idea of the spherical shape of the, of the earth. So the Quran, in fact, uh, goes a step further and, and many steps further. Um, now, let me get to my seventh point, if, if you allow me. Is that the I most interesting, exciting point for I you? I think this uh, is, is, in fact, one of the, one of the most convincing uh, okay. arguments uh, to show that the Quran is, uh, is of divine origin. You know, when, we, when, when uh, believers try to prove the existence of God, we talk about design in everything we see, because mm -hmm. when we see evidence of design, we posit a designer. Otherwise, where did the design come from? It must come from an intelligent mind. Uh, it, it looks like the Quran itself is designed to be the way I it is. Now, when we trace the history of the Quran, we see that uh, there were early followers of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, apparently scurrying about, trying to get every last scrap of, of, of uh, writing material on which the Quranic verses were written, and they try to put that all together. And one gets the idea that uh, this is almost like an ad hoc process of getting the Quran together, and you hope they got it all all in there, mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't miss anything. Uh, well, with that history in mind, when we study the Quran today, we see that things fall into place as if they're designed to be where, where they are. For example, uh, we, we see that the a uh, number of times uh, certain words are used in the Quran, uh, uh, the, the number itself is meaningful. Can you now, give me an example? Uh, for, for example, you find that uh, uh, the word for man and the word for woman each occur in the Quran exactly 24 times in Arabic. Mm. Um, uh, and, and that's one way of thinking about the equality of men and women. Uh, the Quran says that uh, uh, Jesus is like Adam. And, and the point of the Quran is that God created them both. But it is interesting that when you comb the Quran, you find that uh, the, the name Jesus occurs 25 times and the name Adam also occurs 25 times. Mm. Now, now, they seldom occur together. 
uh, and they're scattered in many different uh, surahs or passage uh, chapters of the Quran. So for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to have produced a book over a period of 23 years in which he is uh, responding to events that happen. You see, that's, part of, that's the nature of the Quran that needs to be understood as well. It's not like one author sat down, he wrote the whole thing over a number of years, and then he published it all as a finished product. No, in the case of the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad goes about his usual business. Uh, people ask him questions, he gives a response and that becomes part of the Quran. Something happens, it could be war, there could be marriage, it, and he's responding to these events by making pronouncements. Then all of those pronouncements are collected together from a period of over 23 years uh, of his life and then put into a, a book. So it's not like uh, you might imagine him uh, composing it and, and knowing where he's going you know, mm -hmm. to put things. Yes, polishing and editing and so on. Uh, so to find this kind of coincidence in the Quran uh, is remarkable. Uh, and these are not the only ones when we can go further. Uh, we always contrast angels and demons, Satan and, and Malaika as in the Quran. Uh, 68 times does the Quran mention Satan and 68 times also angels. So uh, th there is a perfect match in the way these words are used. This life and the life hereafter. The Quran mentions this life uh, 115 times and the life hereafter also 115 times. So how does this occur? For the Prophet Muhammad to have done this, he would have had to have a computer mind. He would have to open up his mind into something like a Microsoft Excel worksheet program. Mm -hmm. And every time he recites a verse in the Quran, he would have to put it in a row. And then he'd have to have a number of columns. One column for man, one for woman, one for Adam, one for Jesus, one for Satan, one for angel, one for this life, one for the life hereafter. And every time he recites a verse, he would have to then, if it mentions Adam, he'd have to click one in the Adam column, all the mentally, and uh, click w and so on. And then he'd have to keep his mind on the totals at the bottom to make sure they're coming out right. It seems that this is not a mere coincidence. This is uh, really a divine revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad, designed to be the way we are now discovering that it is. All right, I appreciate those convincing arguments, Dr. Shabir Ali. You're welcome. We'll take a break, and when we return, we'll answer questions we've received from you, our viewers.